So we've been talking about the Lord's Prayer. And today we get to the part of the Lord's Prayer where we, we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. These are words of desperation. Lead us not into temptation. And they are words of hope. Deliver us from evil. We live in a desperate world. There are natural tragedies that take place in our world. The, the world is scarred by sin. Now, sometimes I don't think we really fully grasp what that means. It means that all of creation itself bears the consequences of the collective sin of humanity. Not just the sins you and I commit personally, but including the sins you and I commit personally. But these people that God created, these human beings, our bent towards rebellion, our sin as a whole from Adam and Eve to now, that sin has messed up our world. It's a sin-scarred world where there are earthquakes and there are famines and there are droughts. There, there are devastating effects of the, of the climate. We talk a lot about climate change in our day and age. and We can see places in our world where if climate changes, there's going to be bad situations. Perhaps it's looking at coastal Maine. Perhaps it's looking at a place like New Orleans where there are a lot of people living and yet they're, they're so low and the sea level is so high. My son was talking the other, about a place uh, called Dogger Land. And it's, you've probably never heard of it. It's this, this idea that years ago there was actually like a bridge of land between the United Kingdom and those islands and, and mainland Europe. And somehow over the years the climate changed and that whole area is now underwater, but people used to live there. They call it Dogger Land. But can you imagine what it was like if you lived in that area and suddenly the water was rising and it was gone no more and it was there no more? Can you imagine what it was like for for those who lived in the, the Roman city of Pompeii, a volcano exploded, and suddenly there was tragedy all around. Lives were coming to an end as moms were holding their babies close to them, facing literally fire falling from the sky. And then, yeah, we look at our own world and we see this horrible earthquake in, in Turkey and Syria. It's like 40, 40, over 40,000 people died suddenly, all in like two little, two little countries. And that has an effect on those people. We live in a world where bad things happen to good people because it is a sin scarred world. And in a sin scarred world, we will face trials. It's not if, it's we will. And then there are more personal things. We can talk about the collective sins of the human race, but there are intentional choices people make. We think about things like, like murder, abuse, theft, the things that people intentionally do to one another. We live in a sin scarred world, and that's bad enough, but on top of that, God has given human beings the capacity to love, to freely give of ourselves to, one, to another, to freely say, I want to put what you need ahead of what I need right now. But with that freedom is also the freedom to do the opposite, to hate, to do evil, to say, I'm going to Put what I want ahead of what you want. We live in a sin scarred world. Some of it is the, the sins of the human race, and some of it is the choices people make. 
The word temptation and trial I use almost interchangeably sometimes. But really they describe two different, two related concepts. So if we're going to talk about this first part, lead us not into temptation. What, is, what does that mean? A trial, think of it this way, a trial is an event of living in this fallen, broken world that creates pressure. Maybe you can relate to that. As you've lived in this fallen, broken world, have you ever undergone or, or walked through some type of, a, of an event, something that's going on that creates a pressure on you? I think we can relate to that. And the, then the other temptation is similar, but think of temptation this way. Temptation is, what, is when we consider if we should put ourselves first ahead of God, what we want instead of what He wants. And the two work together because sometimes, in the midst of a trial, the pressure of something that's going on in our life, we are tempted to put what we want ahead of what God wants. And so trial and temptation are kind of linked together but kind of refer to two different ideas. Trial is an event of living in the fallen, broken world that creates pressure. Temptation is when we consider if we should put ourselves first. And then there's a third word, sin. Sin is when we act and we put ourselves first instead of God. And so when we pray, lead us not into temptation, what exactly are we asking of the Lord? Lead us not into temptation. Does God lead us into temptation? No. No, he doesn't. The book of James, um, in, our, in the New Testament, the book of James, uh, probably written by, by Jesus' uh, biological brother, um, a leader in the early church. James is, is very clear in that the very first chapter. He says, no. James says it this way. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. And listen to this. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires And we're dragged away by our own evil desires. N.T. Wright, the, the theologian, kind of paraphrases it this way. Evil desire entices us. God doesn't test us as much as we test ourselves. We are tested by our own desires. In the Bible, the concepts of testing and, temp and temptation uh, are often used almost as if they're synonymous. But there is a slight difference. Testing tends to lead to temptation. That's the difference. We know we live in a fallen world and we face trials as a result of that. We face trials as a result of what humanity's collective sin has done to this world. But in this prayer... We are asking God to minimize how we experience it. So we are asking God to work in our hearts so that the temptations we face are not more than we can bear. The Apostle Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians, No temptation has seized you that isn't common for people. But God is faithful, and he won't allow you to be tempted beyond your abilities. Instead, with the temptation, God will also supply a way out of that, so you will be able to endure it. In other words, he will deliver us. He will rescue us. Sometimes I think we, we use that verse uh, inappropriately. We, we get the context a little wrong. When Paul writes, we won't be tempted beyond our abilities. 
I think what he's getting at is we won't be tempted beyond our ability to not sin. God will work in our lives and our hearts, and we don't have to give in to temptation. He can provide a way out so that we do not sin. But I think we need to understand this verse is getting at this idea of sin and temptation. It's not necessarily getting at the trials we face. Because quite honestly, sometimes we face trials that are more than we can bear. Perhaps they're not more than God can bear. And perhaps he can give us the power to not sin and, and do something worse in the midst of our trials. But sometimes people carry the scars of their trials. Sometimes trials are, are more than we can bear alone. And sometimes people have to, to deal with the emotional fallout from the trials they've gone through. Sometimes people just shut down because they're going through something so horrendous. So yeah, sometimes the trials themselves are more than we can bear alone. But how we react to those trials in the sense of trusting God or not trusting God, that's the part God wants to help us with. That's the God part that God says he will deliver us from, he will rescue us from. Jesus himself was led into the wilderness in order to be tempted by Satan. We can read about that in the Gospels. Jesus, early in his ministry, or just before his public ministry begins, he goes out in the wilderness and he's tempted by the devil in a few different ways. He goes through the difficult trials of hunger and thirst and he is tempted he is tempted, but he says no to his temptations. He does go through trials, but he doesn't sin. Or consider the story of Job. Remember the book of Job found in the Old Testament? It's the story of a man named Job and the conversations that God and Satan are having about him. The conversations his friends are having about him. And in some ways, the conversation his wife is having with him. In the story of Job, God allows Satan to bring pain and tragedy into Job's life. The trials he faces are difficult. They are tragic. But they themselves are not the temptation. In fact, each one of those things that Job faces are common problems of living in a sin scarred fallen world. What makes Job stick out is that they have, they all happened to him, happened all at once. Those were trials. The temptation was not the trials, it was how Job responded to those trials. And if there's anyone in the book of Job who tempts him, the one who tempts him is probably his wife. If you read the story, in the midst of Job's suffering, his wife says, why don't you just curse God and die? Well, that's probably temptation. But you see, this whole thing begins with God saying, look at my servant Job. He's a good man. I'm paraphrasing a bit. And Satan saying, yeah, he's only a good man because he has an easy if things weren't going so well, he wouldn't be so good. And Satan brings these, these trials into Job's life. And his friends just want to accuse him of being sinful. His wife tells him to curse God and die. And Job clings to his hope, to what he knows about himself, that he knows that he has done his best to live a righteous life. He knows that he is not alone in his trials, that there is a God. He knows that his trials won't last forever. 
He says this amazing thing that in the end, I will see my Redeemer with my own eyes. How my heart yearns within me. He knew there was a Redeemer who would rescue him. And he looked forward to that day. God doesn't abandon Job in his trials. He hears Job. And in the end, God does deliver Job from those trials. And Job's not... He's not the only one to face trials. Most of the people we read about in the Bible face trials. A couple in the New Testament... uh, One example might be Peter. Peter was warned by Jesus during the Last Supper that he would be tempted. Jesus says, and this is in Luke chapter 22, Jesus says, but I have prayed for you, Simon. Uh, Or just before that, he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you like wheat. He's referring to the, to the 12 disciples, but he's speaking to Peter. Satan is apt to, asked to sift all of you like wheat to try them. But Jesus says, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and death. And Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will, be, you will deny me, you will deny three times that you know me. Jesus didn't tempt Peter. The Father didn't tempt Peter. Satan tests Peter. But again, The temptation really comes from Peter's own fear. Satan Satan may have tested Peter, but he didn't tempt him. Peter tempted himself. Peter was tempted by his own fear. And I think we can understand that. He had a reason to be afraid. But Jesus, he had confidence in Peter. Jesus knew how Peter would fail him. And he knew how Peter would turn to him. He doesn't say, Peter, if you turn back. He says, Peter, when you turn back, strengthen your brothers. The Apostle Paul writes about his trials in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, I was given a thorn in my body because of the outstanding revelations I've received so that I wouldn't be conceited. It's a messenger from Satan sent to torment me so that I wouldn't be conceited. I pleaded with the Lord three times for it to leave me alone. He said to me, my grace is enough for you because power is made perfect in weakness. So I'll gladly spend my time bragging about my weakness so that Christ's power can rest on me. God didn't tempt Paul. Satan brought trials on Paul. But not so much temptation. Where does the temptation for Paul come in? Paul was tempted by his own conceit. And he was tempted by how he would respond to his pain. In the midst of trials, God's grace and power are offered to Paul. We are encouraged to acknowledge our weakness, our limitations, and to trust Him, and to live out our lives in this fallen world dependent not on our own strength, but God's. Dependent on His grace, His love, His power. We must seek Christ as the one who can rescue us, the one who can deliver us safely home. We must trust that Jesus is our deliverer. We don't walk alone. It's so appropriate we sang that song this morning, There's Another in the Fire. Because we're not alone. We don't walk through this broken, sin-scarred world alone. Job Job didn't walk through this world alone. Peter didn't walk through this world alone. Paul didn't walk through this world alone. 
And neither do we. God has invited us to walk with him. And the truth is, he will walk with us all the way into his kingdom, under his power and for his glory. This morning I was listening to uh, an old Rich Mullins song. It's called, My Deliverer is Coming. And I was reminded of something important. Let me read you a little bit of the lyrics to this song. It says, Joseph, and of course the song is remembering what takes place right after the manger in the Christmas story, when the evil King Herod decides to kill this newborn king of the Jews by simply trying to wipe out all the young children or the young boys. And so the lyrics to the song say, Joseph took his wife and her child, and they went to Africa to escape the rage of a deadly king. There along the banks of the Nile, Jesus listened to the song that the captive children used to sing. And now he's referring back to when the Israelites were captive in Egypt. I'm not sure I understand the meaning of this, but isn't it interesting that one of the profound stories of, of the Bible and in the, the life of the people of Israel through whom God promised our deliverer is that they were for years slaves in Egypt. And yet, when Jesus' life is in jeopardy by an evil king, where does Joseph take his wife and Jesus to escape? They flee to Egypt, where their people had been once been slaves. That's interesting. And of course, the, in the song is a beautiful song. If you have this, this whole story of the deadly king, and then... Um, it says, we hear the words the children used to sing, and in the song there's this hauntingly beautiful children's choir singing. My deliverer is coming. My deliverer is coming. My deliverer is standing by. Those are good words for us. When we face trials, when we face temptation, remind yourself, my deliverer is coming. My deliverer is standing by. My deliverer is right here with me. Uh, those super ads that, that many people were talking about are right in the sense that Jesus does get us. He does understand us. Jesus walked through this broken world and experienced trials and temptations just like we do. He gets us in that way. His birth was marked by an act of evil by, a, by King Herod. His birth was marked by the act of an evil king looking to stay in power. Early in his life, his family had to flee to Egypt seeking to save his life. The world Jesus grew up in was a brutal place. The way the politics of those of those times and places, the way the politics of those in charge impacted the life of the average person in Jesus' day. He gets that. There were wars in Jesus' day. There were natural disasters in his day. Jesus lost people he loved. All of those things that are a part of life for us, those trials we face, those struggles we face in this broken world, Jesus experienced all those things too. In that sense, he does get us. He has been where we have been. He does get us in the sense that he has lived in this broken world just like us. Except for one thing, he conquered his trials. He said no to his temptations. He was crucified, dead, and buried. He rose from the grave victorious because we needed more than someone who gets us. And praise the Lord, Jesus is more than just somebody who gets us. We needed somebody to deliver us. And that's who Jesus is, and that's why Jesus came. He came to deliver us. 
Jesus is our deliverer. We pray, deliver us from evil, knowing that that's what just what Jesus has done and will do and is doing. The Father sent his Son to deliver us. On another note, some of these trials in this fallen world, some of them are the consequences of rejecting God's grace. Some have suggested that God is some kind of cosmic bully. Does God bully us into his kingdom? No. In fact, over the last couple of years, I've really been struck by Jesus' method of evangelism. Jesus didn't evangelize through threats. It's not, come follow me or else. It's true that Jesus mentions or alludes to hell more than any other person in the Bible. But his words were spoken more in warning than threat. And there is a difference. Hell is not a prison where God sends bad people. It's the default destination of all that is unholy. It's the sin that excludes us, that separates us from a holy God. Jesus speaking like about hell is a warning in the same sense that a mother might warn her teenager. If you speed, you'll get an expensive speeding ticket. Or you might get into an accident. The mother isn't threatening to make those things happen. She's not going to make those things happen to punish her child. She's concerned that her son's lead foot is going to have natural consequences. It's the same way with Jesus. When Jesus talks about hell, it's not a threat. It's a warning that we, he doesn't want to see us deal with the natural consequences of rejecting his grace. The amazing thing about Jesus is his method of evangelism is not his great debate skills. Jesus didn't debate anybody into the kingdom of heaven. He didn't forcefully bully anyone into heaven. His method of evangelism was grace, love, and a simple invitation. Jesus spoke to the sinful. He invited them to turn from, from their sin. He invited them to return home different than who they used to be. And if they were ready to hear it, he invited them to come follow him. I think back to my own life. Jesus didn't bully me and say, you need to, to quit doing these, this, quit this destructive, sinful behavior or else. No, I said, how's that working for you? And he invited me, come follow me. Every great conversion story of somebody who was saved from their sins and began to follow Jesus, it always comes back to the bottom line is an invitation was extended to a person who didn't deserve it. Come follow me. Jesus spoke to those who were often ignored or marginalized. He showed compassion and grace he was full of truth and honesty. He had a sort of kind bluntness to him. Jesus didn't sugarcoat the truth. But neither did he condemn people. He invited them to turn from their sin and follow him. God, the majestic creator of all things, is revealed in Jesus to be gentle and humble in heart. God has given over the kingdom into Jesus' hands. Therefore, the humble Savior commissions us to go and teach everything that he's taught us. That's the great commission, right? Go and make disciples, teaching them everything I have uh, taught you. What did Jesus teach? He, mostly, he taught humility. 
Here's one of Jesus' key teachings. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love others as you love yourself. That's one of the things Jesus taught. What else? For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive their sins, your Father won't forgive your sins. Jesus taught forgiveness. Jesus said, so the last will be first and the first will be last. Again, Jesus taught humility. He said this, put on my yoke, my teaching, and learn from me. I am gentle and humble, and you will find rest for yourselves. He taught us to come to him and trust him and learn from him. Jesus called the children unto him and said, Let the little children come unto me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. He was humble. He didn't come to call the powerful, the prideful, the ones who were a big deal. He, they were invited along too but only if they would humble themselves and become like these little children to whom belongs the kingdom of God. John 3, 16 and 17. It says, God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him won't perish but have eternal life. And then verse 17 that we so often forget. God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world but the, the world might be saved through him. God didn't send Jesus into the world to be its judge. He sent him into the world to be its redeemer, its deliverer. Does the kingdom of God that he has entrusted to Jesus include Jesus? Those examples of Jesus' teaching, they, they portray the nature of God's kingdom. God's reign on this earth is through Jesus, the teacher of humility and love. Does God's kingdom include you? Yeah. <clears throat> the God we worship does not hoard power, does not selfishly grasp for glory does not clench his kingdom with tight-fisted omnipotence, saying, you can't come in and you can't come in. We know this because of Jesus. The God we worship is a sharing God, an outpouring God, an inviting God. We know this because of Jesus. Jesus demonstrates power and authority by relying on his disciples, by empowering his disciples, by commissioning his disciples. And by disciples, I mean folks just like you and I. He's called us to go out and teach these things that he has taught us to make fellow disciples, to bring new people into this community of Jesus followers, not by, not by force, but by the word of truth and gentleness, by humility and kindness, and by mercy. There's a Bible verse that talks about being, uh, talks about our words being full of grace, seasoned with salt. It doesn't say full of salt, seasoned with grace. In other words, it's not just a matter of what we say. We should always speak the truth, but we should speak it in love. It's not just a matter of what we say, it's how we say it. Do our words come from a place of humility, full of grace, not hiding the truth, not sugarcoating it, but with the invitation? The same one that was given to us because Jesus invited us to come follow him. We live in a broken, sin-scarred world, a world where 
people are sometimes devastated by the trials of life. And so the question becomes, how will we respond to the people God puts in our, in our path? How will we respond to the hurting, the discouraged, the angry, the bitter, the indifferent? Will we continue to invite them to walk with us as our Savior did? When we pray, lead us not into temptation, we are not so much asking God to take away our temptation, but to minimize it to hold back the full force of the trials that come from living in this sin-scarred world. When we pray, deliver us from evil, we are asking him to walk with us and carry us safely into his kingdom. Because that's who he is. The one who taught us to pray, deliver us from evil, came to do exactly that. Let's stand and sing one last song together this morning. May the love of God the Father and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all and deliver you safely into his kingdom. God bless you and enjoy your afternoon.